everybody, welcome back to Northern Land Place of Binding of Isaac Afterbirth Plus. This is the rare slump where we've been winning. <laughs> we've triumphed over adversity, though beset on all sides by inequity. G94SC12P. How about I see 00P? Because that's gross and should be done in private. Or at least you should talk about it with the person that is observing or being observed in advance to make sure everybody's on the same page. That's all I'm saying. You know, like a couple of Isaac episodes ago, I was talking about the worst possible name for a, a stand-up comedy special on Netflix. Again, I want to stress I haven't watched this. It might be the most amazing comedy special ever uh, made. And actually, now that I think about it, I don't know whether it was on Amazon Prime or Netflix, but that's not uh, relevant to the bit necessarily. Um, I was thinking about that last night while I was scrolling through Netflix, and I saw a comedy special that was just called What's Wrong With People? And I was like, you know, you got me! That's a really good one. <laughs> I mean, what is wrong with people? You drive on a parkway, you park on a driveway. If 7-Eleven is open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, why do the doors have locks? Idiot. <laughs> These are just old email forward uh, jokes. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. Um, this is an Applebee's. Hey, hey, hey! I thought we almost had like a little Take On Me music video thing going on there for a second. That might be a bit of a dated reference, but that is one of those songs that, uh... Oh, there's our secret room. That is one of those songs that, uh, you know, has made it... I, I mean, I, it was not contemporaneous with my generation either. You know, the, the earliest songs that are part of quote-unquote my generation probably came out in like 1996. Take On Me is like a 1984 jam. But that's one of those, you know, once a year or once every six month sort of songs that has made it through the, uh, the annals of time. You know, every year there's a couple of songs that manage to move up uh, in the ash. Maybe like 15 or 20 songs get played next year, and then like five songs get played the year after that, and then in 10 years there's only two songs that get played from that year. Dust them, dude. Please give me a bomb, by the way. It's not a bomb. It's much better. I do hate not being able to access the Tinted Rock, but whatever, dude. Life goes on. Like, that's one of the songs that's made it. You know, from like 1986. Oh yeah, life goes on. Long after the thrill of living is gone. John Cougar Mellencamp. You ever think that we create like a weird uh, musical blind spot sometimes? Okay, I don't know if that was sensible, but... What do, what do I mean by the ridiculous statement, a musical blind spot? Um, well, you can be forgiven for not understanding immediately. By the way, I am a master for not getting hit on this room. This was an incredible performance. This is a very good run, by the way. The only thing that's wrong with it right now is low HP. And our first couple of items didn't necessarily bring the heat, but... All we need is one orbital, and, and we're living in a bubble, baby. The bubble's not reality. You got to have a look outside. Eiffel 65, another song that's made the... It's made the leap from the year 1999. No, but, you know, what I, here's what I mean by a musical blind spot. There's so many, like, classic stations because only the elderly uh, listen to the radio. And I don't mean that to be rude. I listen to the radio. And I'm sure, you know, if, you, uh, if you're, like, a professional driver, you might listen to the radio. There's something kind of romantic about the radio. Not in an amorous sense, but you know, when you listen to the radio, it's like you're kind of connected to the city around you, you know? You're, you're, you're part of the... Wow, this room's got some lighting on it, huh? You're connected to the, the urban environment around you, if you're listening to a local station, at least. You get traffic reports, you get the occasional news, you get to be notified of local businesses. But if you're listening to, like, a, a national or international radio station, I sort of don't understand it, you know? Wouldn't you rather just program, like, your own playlist? Which is why I think that the only people who are listening to that are, forgive the uh, exaggeration, uh, 150,000 years old. Maybe they don't possess the technology or the technological 
know-how in the elbow grease to lead us to our new land. Um, but you know, there's so many classic stations. Like, there's there's top 40. There's classic rock, easy listening, which is basically just like classic rock, but you know, further back in time. Um, you know, adult contemporary. But there's a little like right five to ten years behind you. There's a blind spot. You know, you don't hear too many songs on the radio that re were released in uh, 2014. At least I don't. Mind you, again, I, I mean, I drive probably less than... Trying to run the numbers mentally in my head. I bet I drive less than one hour a week. Some weeks I drive... Maybe three to four hours total. Hold on, I think this one is uh, special too. I'll spend a bomb. It was not. It did glow, so I feel ripped off, but that's okay. But some weeks I'll drive basically like not at all. So I'm not listening to the radio that much, but... I'm also not suggesting this is really a, a viable business model. If you're... <laughs> I, d I don't know if now's the right time to be investing in the medium of radio to begin with, but then on top of that, you're like, check it out. I've got a great idea for a radio station. I, this is just beautiful, of course. Um, I got a great idea for a radio station. Yesterday's hits. All the hottest songs that you loved five years ago. Nothing new and nothing old enough to actually evoke real nostalgia. Exclusively songs that make you go, Oh, I remember that. That's when we were playing Magic the Gathering a little bit. Oh, I think that I found myself a cheerleader. <laughs> she is always right here when I need her. See, I was listening to the radio four years ago. That's when we bought this car. <laughs> but we don't need to go into that bit. I'm so stoked, by the way. We're actually having, like, this run is, is very, very, very strong. I would actually describe this as being functionally unkillable at the present meta. Um, at the present level, I should say. We've got great DPS, and, uh, I mean, the DPS that we have is actually fairly irrelevant, because all we need to do is continue to use Unicorn Stump every single room with Sack Dagger, and it's, it's all over, so... You know, it's nice. Eh? We haven't talked about things unrelated to Isaac for a long time. <laughs> it's been three or four days. We've been stuck in this loop of, uh, of difficult runs. I was we watching... Uh, I mean, watching is kind of an exaggeration. I don't, I don't need to apologize for watching Seinfeld. Again, it's of my generation to some extent. Um, but, you know, Seinfeld was on TV while I was playing some Tetris 99. And I realized... Kramer actually invented Mod Pizza, a restaurant where you make your own pizza. Now, to be fair, you're going to say, NL, that's not fair. Cosmo Kramer, in that Seinfeld episode, said, and I quote, You get the dough, you knead it, you flip it up in the air, you put the sauce on, you put the toppings, and you slide it into the oven. And then George says, you can't just have people sliding things into a 600 degree oven. And then Kramer says, everything's heavily supervised. And then he goes, oh, well, if it's supervised. And then the audience goes, ha, 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 because it's funny. Is that, has there ever been another, I, I mean, I get that it's not quite the same thing as a mod pizza. They, they have the dough pre-made for you, which is like, I'm, you know, I mean, it's actually very different in general. Kind of making an exaggeration for the purposes of the bit. It's really just a pizza place where you choose what goes on the pizza in a different fashion. Which is almost fairly analogous to just about every pizzeria that's ever existed. But anyway, ignoring this, it makes for a good bit. Hold on, we have not seen what's in here. Uh, and we will not take this. Little Brim has a certain temptation until I think, you know, if you evaluate this, I don't think Little Brim is the right fit for our organization right now. It's definitely not to suggest that uh, Little Brim... Come on, this is a great opportunity for Death's List. 
It's not to suggest Little Brim is is unqualified. Merely uh, lacks the specific organizational fit we're looking for right now. Okay. By the way, stop. These are too many good items for one run. Please save some of these items and uh, redistribute them as necessary to items that are more in need. Or to runs that are more in need. So I probably should not have taken this, but here's a controversial opinion. Little bit of extra speed at the cost of damage. Actually, fairly sensible trade-off for us right now. More speed allows us to greater utilize our Sack Dagger uh, invincibility combo. How are things going? They're going well. Thank you for asking. It's, uh, it's finally October. I don't really do uh, anything special for October, but I don't know. Maybe if we finish Deadly Premonition. I oh, well, Deadly Premonition is kind of a, a horror game in its own right. I mean, it's, it is and it isn't, right? <laughs> it's a comedy horror, but, you know, there are horror elements. It's not like Shaun of the Dead. It's more like... Uh, Mm, what's a good example of, a, of a, a horror movie that's funny but also scary? I don't know. Cabin in the Woods is also kind of like... It's more funny than scary. I'm looking for something that... Well, now that I think about it... I don't know if they... I mean, Twin Peaks is probably the best example, but I haven't seen Twin Peaks. I know I should, seen Twin, I should see Twin Peaks. It's not available on any of the Canadian... Streaming services right now, okay? I think. But I'm probably just about the only person on planet Earth that has eaten at a Twin Peaks themed restaurant while having not seen the show. And I gotta say, um, I can't give you a, an honest appraisal, or maybe I'm the only person that can give you an honest appraisal of the quality of the restaurant because I don't have my judgment clouded by Kyle McLaughlin's thumbs up and predilection for a nice cup of coffee. Ooh, dude, it's so good. I thought it was just okay, but here's the thing. It was a vegetarian slash vegan restaurant, and the menu was like, you know, Canadiana. Food, uh, yes, food, of course. Um, poutine, hot dogs, you know, just done in a vegan style. I am the opposite of anti-vegetarian, anti-vegan. As you know, you'll know if you've been watching the show for a long time. However, that's not my uh, idea. And you know, the restaurant is free to exist. You know, you might want that from time to time. Especially if you're more of a strict adherent to the lifestyle. However, for me personally, I was like, eh, this isn't really what I'm looking for. In a, in a vegetarian restaurant is a, a worse hot dog. <laughs> kind of, I was hoping maybe you might have, you know, some kind of chana masala or something like that. Oh well. Anyway, coffee was delicious, though. Just kidding, I didn't have any. It was nighttime. I'm not, I'm not trying to screw up my Pokemon sleep schedule just to get a darn fine cup of coffee. Anyway, keep me moving here. Run is very... I'm, I, I almost don't even know. There's so much more pressure now to figure out something to talk about because uh, the run is basically just press space to win. I appreciate the speed up. Well, you gotta give this guy a shot right here. To get a free item would be worth a lot. Especially a free deal with the devil item. Explosive diarrhea. Here's the thing, brother. I'm willing to give you just a little bit extra on this. Okay, I think I will take succubus and then bounce. Eye of Belial is really good, but we don't need it. I think we're better off... Why, why risk it, right? The... You don't understand the, the indignity that I would face if I lost this run. That is quite clearly, statistically, um, and, you know, just from a... It, it passes the eye test, you know what I mean? Do you guys ever have to buy eye clickers if, if you've already been through college and are around my age? An eye clicker is a... I'm assuming now non-utilized piece of uh, classroom hardware that allows the, you know, in a large lecture hall in particular, but I'm sure if you went to a fancy schmancy uh, high school 
you might have had access to it as well. The professor can basically like script polls and stuff to do during the the lesson, you know? He, he could ask a question like, you know, basically like maybe you're doing examination prep or something like that. And he goes, uh, you know, what is the uh, metabolic reaction called when an electron is added to uh, adenosine biphosphate en route to it becoming adenosine triphosphate? And you know, you got um, a reduction, uh, a dehydrogenation, uh, you know, ele an electrolysis reaction, blah, blah, blah. And then he could uh, poll the audience. The audience could answer, and you'll be like, oh, <laughs> only 35% of you knew that it was called a reduction, huh? You guys better study before the exam. I have to imagine. Okay. Um, that this piece of technology is no longer in high demand. But when I started, it's freaking me out, dude. I started college in the year 2006. It was a $100 piece of technology. This is pre the existence of the smartphone, just to give you an idea um, of, of where we were at technologically speaking. And probably like every other friend of yours had a cell phone 50 percent of your friends had one had a cell phone and you're like wow this is crazy i was still calling my parents on uh on a desk phone when i was in my first year of university it's crazy to me because you know at the time i felt like uh i was in the future but now that i look at it i'm like oh my god if you actually made a movie about you know, the college experience that, like, Malf and I had. We didn't go to the same school, I'm just saying, of the same age. It would actually probably have more in common with a college movie from, like, the 80s. <laughs> than, it, than it would with a movie made in college now. You know... It... Every... 20th person brought a laptop to class. It was not that common. You know, I and I know that it's different now because I've, you know gone to school for programming again and it's uh you know everybody's bringing their laptop very very few people using the desktop computers in the computer lab unless the professor mandates it but anyway i guess i do live in you know one of the most egregiously wealthy cities in the world as well so you know probably there's a little bit of a dynamic at play there when people are all able to afford laptops for themselves or alternatively have their parents buy them for them um not that i'm judging hey hello ruka Honestly, I think we should just fight the boss. I know we just took more options, but I think I'd rather just fight the boss than spend several minutes looking for where to go here. But yeah, I, I mean, I use the desktop computer, not for gaming, just because, uh, you know, laptops were not that common back then. I mean, they weren't super rare, but they weren't that common. Can I... I mean, when I think about it now, it, it, it's funny to me, but... I, I, I can blow your mind, depending on your age, with just a little bit of, like, real memories that happened to me related to technology less than 20 years ago. When I was in 8th grade, it was, like, 2001 and 2002, we had uh, 30 kids in our class, 30 students. We had a class laptop. A laptop for the whole class that sat on a desk in the back of the room. And then we all alternated taking the laptop home. Once, like, every night, somebody else would have the opportunity to sign out the laptop. You couldn't just have one person sign out the laptop over and over. You would pack it up in its bag and, you know, what, what was the benefit of this? Why did you need to sign out the laptop? This, where I grew up, people didn't know what to do with technology like that. And it's not like it's nuclear launch codes or something, but they were like, I don't know. Uh, we have access to a donated Lenovo ThinkPad. I don't know, just let the kids use it at home or something. So I mostly use it to play Space Cadet Pinball on the bus on the way home. A little, little strange. I'm, I'm feeling like these stories are pretty, uh, relevant to my audience. Because I, I looked at my demographics the other day. Sometimes you gotta, you know, if you're... Looking for like a sponsor deal or something like that. You got to look at your demographics, figure out what uh, you know, what the average Northern Lion viewer looks like, so we can trick you into watching an advertisement and then buying a product later. 
Um, so 55% of my watch time. I don't know about the actual user, but in terms of like the average minute digested of Northern Lion content, 55% of that is from America. And then it's like United Kingdom, Canada are second. Then you get into like West, uh, Western European countries. And it, it just sort of trickles down from there. Canada as well, sorry. Did I say Canada and the UK? Yeah. Not quite at spun there. Um, the audience is around 94% male, which is not surprising. I don't think we need any of those either. Um, and, and not disheartening either. Like, I would love if all of the numbers were higher. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they, given the demographics on YouTube, that doesn't surprise me. Um, and what's very interesting is that as the, as you look at the age splits, you know, when it, in the, like, the 13 to 17 demographic, it's like 98% male. Um, it turns out 13 to 17 year old girls don't have much of an interest in what I'm saying. Not, not exclusively, but by and large, the average 13 to 17 year old girl is not getting a whole lot of entertainment value out of youtube.com slash northern lion, which makes perfect sense, I think. Um, but as you get up there, you know, you get into the 18 to 25 demographic and then, uh, you know, it's like 96% male, 4% female. Then in the 25 to 34 demographic, it's like 92% male, 8% female. And you get up into the like 35 to 45 demographic and it's almost like, it's like a 90-10 split. And you're like, you know... Is that because my you know my audience becomes or, or my content becomes more generally palatable as uh, people get older becomes more you know uniformly relatable or is it because the people who watch my content are suffering terrible fates before they enter their 30s <laughs> I, I hope that's not the case I'd like to I'd like to think of it in the positive way, but I am I am guilty on some occasion of trying to find the dark cloud around every silver lining, if you know what I mean. Um, and then, in terms of age, I was actually surprised. I thought, and it, the, basically, I, I won't bury the lead. The audience seems, on average, very, very slightly younger than me, but not by much. Like, by less than five years on average. We got a really, uh, we got two big peaks in viewership. One of them is in uh, 18 to 25, and one of them is in 25 to 34. And I think 25 to 34 was actually larger. Not that much appeal to the Zoomer audience. My memes are not dense enough. When I make a meme, it's like, I'm a fire in my laser. When I've seen Zoomer memes. It's like Peter Griffin... And then it's been, like, chopped and screwed 75 times. They download the video through that weird tool on Twitter that lets you download the video. Makes it all JPEG uh, compressioned, and then they re-upload it again and download it again, like, 35 more times. That's not the kind of content I know how to make. But yeah, it was very interesting for me to take a look at my, my demographics. I, mean, I wasn't really surprised. Uh, if I was surprised by anything, I was surprised to see there actually, you know, a, a relatively high amount of viewership in the over 35 category. I'm sorry to tell you, and you know, I'll be there soon enough, that once you're over 35, to advertisers, it, it goes like, you know, 13 to 17, 17 to 18. 18 to 18 and a half, 19 to 25, 25 to 34, 35 until you're dead. But, the, you know, so big ups to my, my fellow older millennials and older out there. Moreover, you should be stoked because uh, from, a, from a media standpoint, if you're over the age of 35, advertisers absolutely love you. Because you buy things. <laughs> I'm, I'm closing in on that. I buy things. 
Ruka, I'm gonna let you into the office, but I'm not gonna do it until after the video is over, because I can tell this cat is very ornery right now. The video will not go on that much longer, Ruka, I promise. We'll, we'll get it sorted. You're gonna get your wet food. I guarantee it. But yeah, ad advertisers love you, which might, you know... Who cares, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But at the same time, don't think that you're being ridden off. If anything, you're, you're being pandered to. I, ne I never used to get it, you know? When, when I was a teenager and I'd watch television, all the ads were for like stuff that I was like, I don't understand. Why are there so many ads for personal injury attorneys, used cars, um, you know, refinancing loans on your home and yada yada yada? Now that I'm, I'm not quite there, I'm only 30, I'm not quite in that 35, but I'm like, ooh. <laughs> gain pods? Or sorry, Tide pods? Here, I've been using gain flings. I gotta see what's up with this. Honey, they just added a fourth benefit to the Tide Pod. They, they already had detergent and fabric softener uh, and, and some extra smell benefit, but now they also added a Febreze pocket to deodorize 99% uh, of odor-causing bacteria. And she's like, we gotta get that. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> There's like two main demographics, in my opinion at least, and I don't know what I'm talking about, but you know, that's never stopped me before. There's two main demographics that get pandered to in advertisements. Senior citizens, maybe that reflects the kind of content I watch on television. Senior citizens, you know, medication, hover rounds, you know, chair lifts for staircases and stuff like that. My favorite Brian Eno album. Um, sure, I get it. Um, life insurance, etc., etc. You know, though, this is not judgmental. You know, those are things people need. You need change as you get older. Um, I, well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, look, at it, we're dominating this round. The other one is young children. Young enough to not have built up the ability to think critically about lying and advertising, um, but old enough to uh, speak and annoy their parents into buying them stuff. I, I'm, I'm starting to feel insulted, to be honest, because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, Frosted Flakes advertised to me. It's a sugary cereal made of, you know, cornflakes. And, and, like, powdered icing or something. When I was a kid, it made sense. A little cartoon mascot goes, They're great! Now, Frosted Flakes advertisements still advertise to me. They, they show a bunch of, like, uh, you know, 30-something millennials sitting around eating Frosted Flakes, watching a sporting event together. And I'm like, Is this... Is this what you think of my generation? <laughs> We're all getting together to watch the Super Bowl and eat bowls of Frosted Flakes? Have some respect. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you guys have enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. Obviously, radio, of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. And I'll see you next time. See ya!